loving kindness, you are a great and awesome God. We pray that you would speak to us today, deepen our faith in you. Give us clear thinking and conform our lives to your will. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to start a series uh, called Questions That Matter, and that was really inspired. I recently uh, read, uh, finished the book by Tim Keller, who's the um, pastor of uh, Presbyterian Redeemer Church in Manhattan, called Making Sense of God. It's just really an outstanding book, and I would highly recommend anyone read it. It's just a great book. But it really taps into, I think, um, things that are going on, ideas that are going on, cultural assumptions that are going on that need to be raised to the surface and addressed. And so next couple of months, we're going to be looking at kind of the nature of faith, the idea of the sense of self, what it, uh, the idea of identity, freedom, hope, uh, just to mention a couple of the, the th uh, questions that we want to address. I remember many, many years ago, several decades ago, I, I can't remember if it was the last year in seminary or my first year in the pastorate. Beth was uh, in graduate school at MIT, uh, getting her master's in mechanical engineering. I remember we were invited to a party, and uh, at the party, uh, there were a bunch of people milling around like they do at a party, and then someone asked me what I did, and I said, uh, I can't even, I either said I was a seminary student or I'm a pastor, and it was like a lead balloon had just let go. It's like almost like, oh, they almost could look at the disdain on the face of these brilliant people, like, really? I mean, why? I mean, really, the conversation ended. There was just like, I hit the wall. There was no question. There's somebody, it's a lot of times people will be polite. They say, oh, isn't that nice? You know, that's a little bit condescending, but it was like nothing. So we just went on to, I don't know what happened, but I still remember that moment. And and just feeling the kind of the sense like to these students what could be of less worth than doing that or you know having faith in God now that was a number of decades ago and the society has gotten considerably more secular uh, in the time since that happened so that there uh, there there is a sense in which I think in culture our, our culture in the West especially that real truth and real knowledge needs to be empirically verified. It needs to be scientific. So if we have uh, knowledge, knowledge is really only the basis of what can be empirically proved. And people are free to have faith, but there's this huge divide between empirically provable things that we call truth and faith and faith is kind of like feeling personal opinion. Scientific truth is solid. Faith is you can do whatever you want. It's really squishy. There isn't really much. When you go, when you go underneath it, it just really doesn't matter that much. If it makes you feel good, that's okay. And so I think that raises the question, does faith oppose reason or does reason oppose faith? I think that's a very important cutting edge question that we as professed Christians need to get our minds wrapped around in terms of understanding the culture, also engaging secular people in the culture, and having a credible witness. And so I, I, I want to talk about this issue is our faith uh, and reason uh, oppositional? Do they oppose one another? Is the only truth that we really can have scientific truth? Because one of the statements that people will, secular people will make is, well, if you can't really prove that in the supernatural realm exists, then, you know, you got nothing. And this actually is based on a claim. There is a man named William Kingdom Clifford, who in 1870, he was a philosopher and a scientist. In 1877, he wrote a notable essay called The Ethics of Belief. 
And in that uh, article, he wrote this. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. And he defined sufficient evidence, and by sufficient evidence he meant empirical evidence that would convince any reasonable person who is capable of assessing it, okay? Now, most people, and most secular people who uh, follow this argument wouldn't know, wouldn't know Clifford, uh, wouldn't know his argument really, but that's really what it stems from. And so basically it's saying, you know, if you can't prove it scientifically, then you can't believe it. Now, there are a number of problems with Clifford's argument and with this secular argument in general. The first is it can't even meet, okay? It can't even meet its own standard. We should not believe something unless we can prove it, but what empirical proof is it for that proposition? Okay, you follow? He's saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't believe anything that we can't prove it, but that statement, how is that empirically verifiable? It's not empirically verifiable. That's an assumption based on a certain belief. You follow that? Some of this stuff's a little heavy, but I, I just think it's important that we, under, we understand that. Another reason why the argument is really very problematic is because when you think about it, most very important things in life are not empirically provable. And for most of those areas, we don't apply proof. Take the, the um, area of human rights. How can you prove, empirically prove, there should be something like human rights? Or that we should treat people with dignity and equality? Or when we have standards of what is evil behavior and good behavior? None of these other areas that we consider to be very important in life, nobody ever says, oh, you, when we talk about, well, we should pe uh, treat people with equal dignity, no one says, I want the empirical proof that we should do that. You can't give empirical proof for that. It's a, basically a, ba a faith statement that has compelling reasons for us to believe, at least in our culture at this time. It didn't for many, for thousands of years, it didn't. So, so first of all, it, ca it can't even live up to its own standard. Uh, secondly, um, it, it, it doesn't really apply, uh, it doesn't apply to many areas of life. So why should we apply it uh, you know, why should we just say, well, in the case of religion, you got to prove it? Well, that's not, that's not even actually fair. And, and it's also not applicable because science itself, the basic assumptions of science itself cannot be empirically improved. Science is based on two very important assumptions that are not approvable. One is that the universe is rational. So in other words, if I take a temperature at a certain altitude over here, scientists are pretty clear and pretty uh, believe that if they go someplace else, they get a certain uh, temperature, if they go somewhere else. But the, the, so that there's a way in which the universe is rational. There's ways in which you can understand it. Things are consistent. But there's no way to actually prove that the universe is rational. And also, the, the universe is contingent. Now, by contingent, we mean it needs not be. It's not necessary. The universe is not logically necessary, and although it may be logically possible, not necessarily logically impossible. In other words, because the universe is contingent, we need to discover things. We need to observe and experience things to discover the universe. If the universe was not contingent, so for example, in Eastern thought, in Hinduism, basically the world is kind of like an emanation from God's thought. It's just a continuation, an emanation from God's thought. So in that case, you wouldn't really need science because all you'd need is some deep contemplation. If you really wanted to understand the universe, you would want to understand the emanate, that, that the world emanates from God and you'd want to know God and there would be no need to really do observation. The contemplation would be the way that you would understand it. So, so there are some uh, very important reasons in terms of why this proved to me that God exists or that the supernatural exists, that itself is not, in, is not empirically provable. 
The other thing I think that's interesting, there's many things we could say, but the other area I think that's very interesting is in the area of what we call skeptical doubt, critical, radical doubt. And again, it was the uh, philosopher of, and scientist, Michael Polanyi, who uh, in the early part of the, tw in mid part of the 20th century, talked about doubting and faith being actually equivalent. He says this, the doubting of any explicit statement denies one belief in favor of other beliefs which are not doubted at the same time. You can't doubt belief A except on the basis of some belief B you are believing instead at that moment. And then he gives an example. For example, you cannot say no one, uh, no one can know enough to be certain about God and religion without assuming at the same moment that you know enough about the nature of religious knowledge to be certain about that. You follow the logic of that? So the point in all of this is all fundamental propositions from which we start of, all of them are beliefs. There's no fundamental starting point from which we can start that is not a belief. And then we use reason based on our, our background, our personal experience, we use our, uh, our intuition, our social experience, and everything of the kind. We, all, all of these things then we bring to these basic beliefs and we try to make sense of the world. Now, the reason I think this is important is, first of all, we need to understand that's not, that doesn't prove that Christianity is true. We're not saying that this proves Christianity is true, but it does level the playing field. And I think it's important for us as we engage in the world that we want to have a sense of uh, confidence that a lot of the secular arguments are not rational, I mean, are not empirically based. Everyone starts with sets of beliefs so that a thoroughgoing secularist has just an alternative set of beliefs that he or she is using as they try to understand the world. Just like those who us are followers of Jesus have a set of beliefs, but we use all of our rational thoughts to try to make sense of this and to live these out. Now, it seems to me also that as we are engaging with the secular world, people that really don't believe in the existence of God or the universe, there needs to be a sense of humility. There is no such thing as certainty. The bottom line is, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I, uh, I'm not infallible, but it's the same, it's the same for uh, Dawkins or Sam Harris, who are kind of the new, uh, some of the new fundamentalist atheists. As, some, as they are referred to in some ways. I mean, all, we're all starting from statements of belief. And so I think it's important for us then to, to have one, a sense of confidence, a sense of humility. We could all be wrong. We, we could be wrong. They could be wrong. And then also uh, that we just have a, a way of dealing with people and listening to them that is winsome and charitable and and understanding because the bottom line is faith and uh, reason they work together belief is woven into the very essence of uh, what it means to think and what it means to believe it's all woven into it and you can't just pull out belief without ripping out the reasoning as well they go together now at this point, I want to shift gears just a little bit to say, I do think it's important for us to know this as we engage the world. But on the other hand, I want to say that if that's all our belief is, what really is compelling to people is not good arguments. I, I think it's important that we are prepared to help people to take away stumbling blocks that might prevent them from understanding the truth of the gospel. But really, it's changed lives. It's a faith that is living that really makes the difference. 
Which brings me to the scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's the Shema of Judaism. Hear, O Lord, the, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your strength. And then Jesus takes that and adds Leviticus 19, 8, 18 to it and says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The kind of faith that God is calling us to is not just an intellectual faith, but something that is tangibilified, to take a Stephen ministry term, something that has shoe leather on it. And so we are called to be living this faith that we are professing. Nobody, to my knowledge, was ever argued into the kingdom of heaven. Right? We can't argue people into the kingdom of heaven. We can with people, and we might be able in the conversation to take away obstacles that was, what, that was preventing them from actually taking that step. But it's God and the Holy Spirit, and I would say to you, it's live faith that really makes the difference. So that a church, we are to be a place, as imperfectly as we do it, that uh, welcomes people, that loves people, that forgives people, a community that is reconciling, and we do it in very um, kind of, in, in very concrete ways. We're not just floating up here in abstractness, but we, we have really, we make it concrete, and people see that in, in a culture that I think is in, in, uh, increasingly uh, isolated, where people don't have deep connections, where they don't feel deeply loved, where they're feeling judged, where they're, where they're just not a sense of belonging, that is going to be a kind of fragrance that will attract people. Which brings me to the next challenge, so to speak, and the challenge is this. Does your faith have any impact on the way you live your daily life? Does your faith have any impact on the way you live your daily life? You know, you can be thinking, oh, yeah, you know, you could be buying this uh, argument that of Polanyi and saying, okay, that all makes sense to me. But if it, isn't a, if it doesn't involve a changed life, then in, one, in terms of the Christian faith, it's worthless. That's what Jesus was talking about. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I just want to go back. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do deeds in your name? Then I will declare them, I never knew you. Go, go away from me, you evil, evildoers. And then he says in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Another, they incorporate the Christian faith needs to be incarnated. It needs to be enfleshed. It needs to be lived. So, for example, it should have an impact on the way we live our daily lives. So, let me give you an example, a couple examples from my own life. So, in my own life, I try not to swear or use vulgar language. Now, why do I do that? I don't do that because God's got a big checklist there. Oh, Phil didn't swear today. Ding. You know, I get a, get a gold star today. That's not why I do that. Because I want God to shape me. I want to be shaped by love to live a life of love. And so the scripture off and on is saying, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so, how, so you know how to answer everyone. Or it in the book of James it says out of the same mouth come both blessing and cursing beloved that should not be the same so I don't use the F word I try not to use the F word I try not to swear I'm not saying I don't do that perfectly but my goal is doing it not because I want to be some pious freak or because I'm going to get brownie points with God because I know the direction that God wants my life to be I want to live my life that way so I don't want to use vulgar and unkind words and use language 
that will hurt other people or it's just it's demeaning. I don't watch pornography. Am I tempted by pornography? I sure am. But I don't because pornography does not shape me into the kind of person God wants me to be. If I watch pornography, it doesn't help me to see women as uh, sisters, as uh, humans with dignity and who are to be loved and cared for. I see them as objects for my pleasure. And it's like, so pornography, it's not like God's got a big check. Oh, Phil didn't look at any pornography today. He didn't get a gold star. It's not, it's not about keeping rules. It's about the image. What is faith calling us to? It's being shaped by love so that we can truly be loving people. How does your faith shape how you spend your money? Does it shape how you treat the poor? Does your faith shape um, your decisions in terms of entertainment? Does it, uh, does it affect the way you act when you're at a party? See, all of these things, we can think about them and the wrong way of thinking about this is kind of a list of do's and don'ts that we're supposed to follow just to please God. That's the whole totally miss the point. The point is, whatever we do shapes us, and we are called to be cross-shaped, love-shaped people who then engage in the world in a way that the world so desperately wants to be engaged but doesn't, can't do it on its own. And so I, I want to challenge those of us that are here today to ask yourself, is my, does my faith actually shape, does it actually impact the way I live my life? Could other people, know, would other people know that I'm a follower of Jesus by kind of the daily things that I do? That, I think, is the whole point of everything. So we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to be defensive when we meet some smart people who challenge our faith and say, oh, you know, you're just, that's faith, that's personal. You know, any, whatever, whatever, whatever you can believe, that's fine. But, you know, you, you know, you don't know the real, you don't have the real rational stuff. We don't have to be put off by that. We don't have to be offended by that. We can have confidence and humility and engage them and say, well, you basically have a set of beliefs that are just different than mine, and many of your beliefs you can't prove either. So do faith and reason oppose one another? They work together. But they also do oppose one another in the way that the thumb opposes your fingers. Isn't that an evolutionary theory, one of the huge uh, leaps of humans is we have the opposable thumb. And the opposable thumb allows you to do what? You grasp things. You pick things up. You can create things. You can make things. So there is a way in which reason and faith work together, opposable in a constructive kind of way. Or my last image that I, I like to think about reason and faith is ballroom dancing. If you ever watched ballroom dancing, the couple, they're facing one another most of the time, right? They go out and do twirls and things like that, but they're, they're facing one another, opposed to one another. But they're opposed to one another in doing an incredibly beautiful, graceful dance. They're working together. And so I would submit to you that that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about faith and reason. They work together. They were made so that we might live well. And may God give us the grace to be those people who own it, who take it, and let God move and change our hearts. Amen.